Hi, I'm Dennis Nash, and this session is on the epidemiological, biological, and immunological properties of infectious diseases with examples of recent emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases. First, though, as a reminder, there are two discussion board posts based on the readings and lecture content for this week that are due on Sunday, September 18th on Blackboard. The content of this lecture will cover properties of infectious diseases, and then we'll go into examples of, West Af of the West African Ebola virus outbreak in 2014, the Zika virus outbreak of 2015 and 16, and most recently and presently, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the novel coronavirus pandemic of 2019 and 2020. But before we jump into the lecture, I wanted to point you to a few resources related to the Global Burden of Disease project that we covered last week. The first is a link to the Global Burden of Disease interactive data visualizations where you can go and recreate any of the graphs that I presented last week or create your own. It's really a great way to gain insights around the burden of disease around the world and in specific countries or geographic areas. What we looked at last week really only scratches the surface of what the Global Burden of Disease Project has to offer in terms of interactive data viz. The second link here is a link to the TED Talk by Chris Murray, who's the founder of the Global Burden of Disease Project. And I will put the links to both of these resources in the comment section on the YouTube post for, for the lecture. So in this part of the lecture, we'll cover the different ways of classifying infectious diseases and agents. We'll cover what constitutes an exposure to an infectious agent, what we mean by the concept of infection, uh, the, the characteristics of infectious diseases, the immune system response to infection, and, measure, uh, and measures of infectious disease occurrence. Of course, these are very big topics. What we're doing is we're covering the, the parts that are really useful from an epidemiological standpoint, just to introduce you to some of the concepts. Each of these issues in their own can, you know, be, can have entire uh, lectures devoted to them, but we're gonna cover just enough to get you on the uh, right page conceptually to help, help get us through the rest of the course. So there are many different ways to classify infectious diseases. For our purposes, we'll be concerned with microbiological, clinical, and epidemiological classifications. Microbiological classification refers to the type of agent. So is it a bacteria, a virus, a parasite, fungus, or a prion? Clinical classifications refer to the type of symptoms and organ systems that are affected by the organism or agent. Influenza, for example, is a respiratory virus. Coronavirus was initially classified as a respiratory virus as well, but we've come to learn that it affects almost every organ system. And finally, epidemiological classifications refer to the mode or modes of transmission or the ways in which infections are transmitted from the source to the uninfected host. So things like airborne or foodborne or by the so-called reservoir of the agent, which refers to the natural habitat where it lives, grows and multiplies in nature. The reservoir of an infectious agent is the habitat in which the agent normally lives, grows, and multiplies in nature. Reservoirs include humans, animals, and the environment, and the reservoir may or may not be the same as the source from which an agent is transferred to a susceptible host. For example, the reservoir of coronavirus is bats, but the source of most human infections is other humans. And transmission can also occur through direct contact of humans with the reservoir. An important epidemiological classification is the mode of transmission of an infectious agent from the source to the infected individual. Broadly, the mode of transmission can be either direct or indirect. Direct refers to transmission directly from the source, and this includes things like person-to-person -person transmission resulting from exposure to, say, the droplets from sneezes and coughs, or sexual activity, skin-to-skin -skin contact, or transmission across the placenta during pregnancy. Direct transmission can also result from direct contact with the reservoir, for example, getting hookworm through direct contact with soil or getting coronavirus through direct contact with bats. Indirect transmission is when an infectious agent makes its way to another human indirectly from the source. 
Vehicle-borne transmission occurs via drinking contaminated water or eating contaminated food or coming into contact with a fomite. A fomite is a kind of a vehicle that for an infectious agent that is an inanimate object, such as a contaminated smartphone or a surface like a doorknob or the bar you hold on the subway or a, a towel. Indirect transmission can also occur via vectors living things such as mosquitoes as it occurs with malaria or dengue. Mosquitoes are not the source of these agents per se, but rather intermediaries. The mosquitoes pick up the infectious agents when they bite an infected human, and then they pass those um, infections on when they bite another human who's not yet been infected. Airborne transmission is also an example of indirect transmission because the agent is carried by the air from the infected person before infecting a susceptible person. In the case of measles, which is an airborne viral infection, infection can occur when entering a room hours after an, an infected person has left, or even uh, travel from one room to another through the air or ventilation system. The um, intermediate step required for the agent to be transmitted from the source to the host is what makes it indirect and not direct transmission. And importantly, some agents can even have more than one mode of transmission. This is a schematic which dates at least back to when I took infectious disease epi in graduate school in the 90s, but it shows more detail for person-to-person -person transmission with the different entry points, e exit points and entry points of pathogens. And here are some examples of infectious agents and their modes of transmission. HIV is an example of an infection with more than one mode of transmission. So what constitutes exposure to an infectious agent? As you might expect, it depends on both the agent and the modes of transmission. Also, for epidemiologic purposes, being exposed to an infectious agent does not necessarily mean that the agent has been internalized. So we can think about exposure and the possible outcomes following exposure to an infectious agent. Well, so there are three main outcomes that can occur. One is that the person does not become infected. And another one is that the person becomes infected but doesn't exhibit any symptoms. And this is known as asymptomatic or subclinical infection. And the third outcome is that the person develops mild or, or severe symptoms. And within these three categories, there are additional outcomes that are possible, such as the when the infection does not occur, it could because it could be because the agent wasn't really able to gain a foothold in the host, perhaps because the degree of exposure to the agent wasn't high enough to penetrate the body's defenses, or the person's immune system could have prevented it because of prior immune immunity, or they could have become um, a carrier of the agent without becoming infected. So these are three possible outcomes after exposure to an infectious agent, even though the person does not necessarily become infected. The second possible outcome, subclinical infection. In this situation, there could be an infected carrier state whereby the person carries the infection and they're, they're, this could be a chronic infection state. They could also develop long-term or long-term immunity, or there could be no immunity at all. There are many agents that don't confer immunity, and even um, for those that do, sometimes asymptomatic or mild cases of an infection um, don't confer immunity to the host. And lastly, when infection results in symptoms, these could be because th these could be very severe symptoms and even result in death. But when death does not occur, it's possible that the individual could become a carrier, could develop immunity or, or could not develop immunity depending on the agent. And the infectious dose, I just want to comment on this, this will come up a few times, the, the, the amount of agent that a person is exposed to can also be an important driver of severity and maybe even immunity. So infection is defined, so given exposure and then when infection does occur following it, exposure, uh, we, we define infection as the entry and development or multiplication of an infectious agent in the body of humans or animals. The natural history of infection can be variable from one infected person to the next, which is sometimes referred to as the spectrum of infection or the spectrum of disease. 
With chronic infection, individuals can go on to develop organ damage or malignancies, such as with hepatitis C, causing cirrhosis and liver cancer in a subset of those who are, are, are infected. You can think of infection, or you can think of the, the spectrum of disease and infection as an iceberg, with the most severe cases at the tip and with less severe symptoms above the surface or waterline and those without symptoms being below the surface. And it's how much of the iceberg is visible above the waterline really varies from one agent to the next. And of course, your likelihood of being diagnosed with an infection you know, is, is low when you're not having any symptoms. There may be no reason to uh, suspect infection or to be tested unless there's, there's screening going on, but your likelihood of being diagnosed becomes higher the more, the more severe the symptoms you, are, you, you develop as a result. So for example, in the case of West Nile virus, um, a mosquito-borne viral infection that affects the central nervous system, the spectrum of illness among those infected ranges from asymptomatic to mild illness to central nervous system disease and death. And epidemiologic studies have shown that only about 20% of people infected show any signs or symptoms of West Nile, um, with most of them having mild illness with fever. However, a small percent of those individuals develop diseases of the central nervous system, such as meningitis or encephalitis. And about 10% of, of those cases are fatal, but only about 0.1% of all infections result in death since 80% of the people that are infected don't show any symptoms at all. And we'll, we'll see examples and we'll see how this specific iceberg and these estimates were obtained when we get to the session that focuses on the 1999 West Nile virus outbreak in a, in a few weeks. This slide shows the different stages of infection over time. Starting at time zero, the individual is susceptible to infection, but not yet infected. At the start of infection here, you see a rising curve that represents the level or amount of the agent that is within the host, which is increasing because it's multiplying in the host. For those that do exhibit symptoms following infection, the time between when someone is infected and when symptoms begin here and here is called the incubation period. And also people are not always infectious after they are infected. It can take some time after the infection for the amount of agent to be high enough to cause infection in another susceptible host. So you see this period here. They are not infectious here, but when it reaches a minimum level for transmission, they, they, they become infectious. And that time period between someone is in, when someone is infected and when they become infectious or infective is called the latent period. Depending on the agent, those infected can be infectious before, during, or after they develop symptoms. And this presents different uh, challenges for uh, disease control and prevention. For example, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, people can be very infectious immediately before symptoms occur, as well as while they have symptoms. But with Ebola virus, people are not infectious before the onset of symptoms. So for treatable infections also, treatment can sometimes reduce the infectious period and, and the symptomatic period. This is a schematic that shows the timeline for an infected patient going from right to left. They're not infectious until the infectious period begins right here, during which time they can transmit the infection to one or more susceptible persons. For example, to this, this second patient here. And the average or median time between the onset of symptoms in the first patient, so they start clinical disease here, and that of the second patient's onset of clinical disease or symptoms is referred to as the serial interval. And it is basically the time between the symptoms of one infected patient and the symptoms of the subsequent people that they uh, go on to infect. The serial interval is directly related to the incubation period for an infectious agent. The incubation period is the average or median time between infection and onset of signs or symptoms. And the incubation period reflects the time it takes for microbial agents to replicate and cause disease in, in the body.
incubation periods can be variable due to the dose or inoculum or the amount or level of exposure to the agent, the route of exposure. So if it's breathed in versus if it's, if it's exposed through, if you're exposed through ingestion and the rate of replication of the organism, as well as host factors um, such as age, nutritional status, immune function, or genetics. Because of this variability, incubation periods are reported as medians with ranges or an average. For example, the incubation period for coronavirus is a median of about five days with a range of about two to 14 days. And we'll see examples of how epidemiologists determine the incubation periods uh, of infections later. This slide shows how incubation periods of infectious diseases vary from agent to agent for bacterial infections on the top panel and viral infections on the bottom. For bacterial infections, the incubation periods generally vary from hours to days with, uh, with the exception of, of leprosy. We see a bit more spread for viruses and the average incubation period for HIV infection is um, an outlier, which is about 10 years between when someone becomes infected and when they may first exhibit symptoms of AIDS. But it also shows how variable the incubation period can be for each agent. And this is shown by the range you see of the black bars. These uh, black bars represent the most common observed incubation period. So even within an agent, it can be variable for reasons um, we've discussed. Another important characteristic of infectious diseases is immunity, or the degree to which an infection results in immunity. This is called immunogenicity. Immunogenicity is defined as the ability of an organism to produce an immune response after infection that results in protection from subsequent reinfection with the same or similar organisms uh, if, if someone is re-exposed. Infections that confer immunity are referred to as being immunogenic. Now, it, immunity may be temporary or lifelong, and, and the fact that some infections induce uh, long-term immunity is what spurs the development of uh, vaccines for many infectious diseases. Whether or not SARS-CoV-2 confers immunity is a very open question right now, as many people now have antibodies to the virus, but we don't yet know with certainty whether those antibodies will have short or long-term immunity or if effective vaccines can be developed. As you might imagine, many of the characteristics we've been talking about depend on the properties of the agent, the host or the infected person, and the environment in which an agent uh, and host coexist. In infectious diseases, this is referred to as the epidemiological triad. Agent factors refer to the characteristics of the agents, such as how infectious, how infectious or lethal they are. Host factors refer to the characteristics of those individuals that become infected, and these include things like the age of the patient, the status of their immune system, etc. And environmental factors refer to those things like urban or rural settings, uh, whether it's cold or hot climate, wet or dry, high or low population density, things like that. And all three of these things, of course, interact to influence the risk of infection, disease, or onward transmission in individuals and populations. So let's delve into some important, important agent-related factors. These include infectivity, pathogenicity, and virulence. Infectivity is the ability of an agent to cause an infection in a susceptible host. So it uh, relates to the minimum number of infectious particles of an agent necessary to cause an infection. Pathogenicity is the ability of a microbial agent to induce disease given that infection has occurred. And finally, virulence is the severity of the disease after the infection occurs. And it's measured by things like the proportion of cases that develop severe disease or the case fatality rate. And all of these can be mediated or influenced by the route of infection or the infectious dose at the time of exposure. So just to illustrate these, these properties, this table characterizes or categorizes several infectious agents by their infectivity, pathogenicity, and virulence going uh, across the table here. 
So smallpox is highly infectious. If you're exposed, the likelihood of becoming infected is very high. It's also highly pathogenic. If you're infected, the likelihood that you'll develop some symptoms is also high. Very few people have asymptomatic smallpox infection. And it's also highly virulent. So if you do have any symptoms, the chances that they will be very severe and potentially fatal uh, with smallpox is also very high. And you can contrast these characteristics for another infection, such as chickenpox. It's, it's also very infectious, like smallpox. And if you do become infected with chickenpox, the chances that you are going to develop some symptoms are pretty high. However, the virulence or the severity of those symptoms are sort of on the low to very low side. So moving on to host-related factors, these include things like the age, sex, genetics, and nutritional status, and also things like stress, immunity, whether you're co-infected with other infections, whether you have comorbidities, uh, whether you smoke. These are things that relate to characteristics of the individual who's at risk of infection who, or, or who has an infection that can influence their, their outcomes. And examples of environmental factors that can influence the risk of infection or development or severity of symptoms or the risk of onward transmission include uh, things like physical condi conditions, the temperature of the environment, uh, presence of insects or rodents, as, as we saw with, with plague in the last lecture, the housing environment and uh, water and food supply and how, how good or, or, uh, or bad the HVAC systems uh, may be at circulating air. And then you can also think about environmental factors that are more like social determinants. So the extent to which there's high or low immunization coverage for um, a particular infection, the extent of household crowding or poverty, cultural practices, um, sexual networks, and access to medical care, all examples of, of environmental factors that are in the realm of social determinants of health. So the next part is discussing issues related to the immune system's response to infection. You know, the immune system is involved in all infections and there are really different cell types that can play a role in both pathogen specific and non-specific immune system responses to infection. B lymphocytes produce pathogen specific antibodies called IgM, IgD, IgG, IgE, and IgA. The Ig stands for immunoglobulin. And these antibodies are often the basis for diagnostic tests or uh, serologic or antibody tests, which are important from an epidemiological standpoint. Of the different antibodies, antibody types here, IgM is one of the first to appear and can be used as an indicator of, of recent infection in many cases. And IgG antibodies are the ones that can stay around for years or decades after an infection and in some cases confer immunity against the reinfection. So having, having IgG antibodies to an agent indicates, uh, doesn't indicate whether you're currently or recently infected, it indicates that you, you have had the infection at some time in the past. So T lymphocytes provide a regulatory function, including immune cell activation, modulation, and lysis. And they play a central role in cell mediated immunity, cell mediated immunity that, that doesn't involve antibodies. And so this makes them you know, not, not so useful from a diagnostic or epidemiologic standpoint because they're not pathogen specific. So during and after the West Nile outbreak in 1999 in New York City, we measured antibodies to West Nile virus among patients over time. And we, we saw that nearly all the patients were producing IgM antibodies, those, those antibodies that indicate early infection, soon after their symptom onset. And we also saw that that proportion decreased with time. However, even out to 500 days uh, after their illness onset, 60% uh, of those West Nile patients were still producing IgM antibodies. And looking at the IgG antibodies, those antibodies that indicate um, infection sometime in the past, um, all of the West Nile patients were making IgG antibodies by 12 months after infection. <laughs> 
So lastly, in this section of the lecture, uh, epidemiologic measures of infectious disease occurrence include things like prevalence and incidence, things that, that you've learned in the, your basic epidemiology course. But recall that the prevalence of infection is equal to the incidence times the duration of the infection. When the duration of the infection is short, the prevalence um, is essentially equivalent to the incidence. But when the duration of the infection is long, prevalent cases in the population represent a mix of people with new and long-standing infection. Duration of infection can be influenced by the natural history of the infection, including its survival, whether there's a chronic carrier state, and also whether or not there are treatments that can cure the infection. When measuring or describing incidence and prevalence, it's critical to define what constitutes a new case of infection. Is it anyone who is infected regardless of whether they have symptoms or anyone who tests positive regardless of symptoms, um, only people with symptoms or anyone with symptoms who's diagnosed uh, by a healthcare provider? These are special issues that need to be considered when, when doing calculations and, and making estimates or measures of infectious disease occurrence that specifically relate to uh, the numerator or what, what, uh, you, who you count as a case. So now that we've covered some key properties of infectious diseases, we'll go through a few examples of recently emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases. First example is the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 pandemic caused by a novel coronavirus. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that can cause illness in animals or humans. In humans, there are several known coronaviruses that cause respiratory infections. These coronaviruses range from the common cold to more severe diseases such as severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, and of course, COVID-19. SARS-CoV-2 is a spherical single-stranded RNA virus that is 500 to 200 nanometers in diameter. It causes coronavirus disease or COVID. So SARS-CoV-2 refers to the virus and COVID refers to the disease caused by the virus. COVID-19 was identified in Wuhan, China in December, 2019, and the virus SARS-CoV-2 can be spread from person to person. Early in the outbreak, many patients were reported to have a link to a large seafood and live animal market. However, uh, later cases with no link to the market confirmed person to person transmission of the disease. Because of the highly infectious nature of SARS-CoV-2, the fact that it is a novel virus to which no one has immunity and international travel, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 quickly resulted in a pandemic, which continues to spread rapidly in many countries today. The infectious period begins two days prior to symptom onset and asymptomatic spread is believed to be common. Its reservoir, the reservoir for uh, SARS-CoV-2 is bats, with the virus possibly spilling over to humans via another mammalian species, pangolins. The incubation period for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID disease is about five days with a range of two to 14 days. One large study that described the spectrum of illness and risk factors for death among the 44,672 lab-confirmed cases that were reported to the Chinese CDC through February found that among those who developed symptoms, SARS-CoV-2 causes mild or moderate disease in about 81% of patients and severe acute illness in about 19% of patients. And the case fatality rate in those with severe illness was estimated to be about 12.4%. Treatment for COVID is supportive with experimental treatments being evaluated in humans as we speak. And also there is no vaccine as yet, but several candidate vaccines are currently in phase three clinical trials. SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted by both direct and indirect modes of transmission. Specifically, direct person-to-person -person transmission can occur through exposure to coughs, sneezes, exhaled droplets, or aerosols of an infected person. Indirect transmission can occur via contact with surfaces or objects recently contaminated with the virus via droplets or aerosols. Since there's no vaccine, prevention and control strategies include so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, like wearing masks or physical distancing, hand washing, isolation, and quarantine. 
And when the level of transmission is substantial enough that it threatens to overwhelm the healthcare system, extended lockdown or stay-at-home quarantine orders are very effective at reducing spread. The main risk factor for infection is having direct close contact with an infected individual. There may be added risks associated with the infectious dose and uh, being male appear, appears to be associated with a higher risk. And there are also examples of super spreader events, which we'll talk about. And these usually relate to uh, appears to be aerosol or maybe airborne transmission. But once someone is infected, the risk factors for severe disease and death can include age, comorbidities, high infectious dose, being black or Hispanic, race, ethnicity, male sex, poor access to care, and poor quality health care. One of your readings this week was the New England Journal article from March of 2020 uh, entitled Early Transmission Dynamics in Wuhan, China of Novel Coronavirus Infected Pneumonia. It's a report of the first 425 patients in Wuhan with novel coronavirus infected pneumonia. So it doesn't describe all of the cases that occurred there. It's an example, though, of an outbreak investigation, which is often conducted early and or rapidly as, as rapidly as possible in the early stages of an outbreak of any novel pathogen to quickly gain an understanding of the microbiological, clinical, and epidemiological properties of the pathogen so that you can inform strategies to control the outbreak, inform the clinical management of patients and, di and their diagnosis, and also to inform infection control. Since outbreak investigations for novel pathogens are often conducted rapidly and under very challenging circumstances, they don't always get everything right. For example, this outbreak investigation focused only on those patients with pneumonia, but we know that uh, severe COVID illness and death can be due to the viruses, to the to the viruses uh, or immune system effects on other organs besides the lungs, but this wasn't really appreciated fully early on in the uh, the emerging pandemic. I've included here also some pictures of Wuhan city to give you a sense of the setting where SARS-CoV-2 emerged. Um, Wuhan is a, a very large city of over 11 million people. These are pictures of a live animal market in Indonesia, which is the kind of setting in which the initial transmission of, of SARS-CoV-2 from animals to humans is thought to have taken place. One thing that characterizes a live market is that many of the animals are killed at the market right before being sold to the customer. And this, this brings people into much closer contact with live animals, as well as their blood and freshly slaughtered remains, which could result in pathogens being transmitted from their animal reservoirs to, to humans. And if those pathogens in turn can be transmitted efficiently among humans by other means after someone becomes infected, it can cause an outbreak or even a pandemic. And as we saw in the last session, most of the recent major emerging infections originated from animal reservoirs, including HIV, Ebola, West Nile virus, Zika, SARS, MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2. The uh, Huanan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan, China, shown on the bottom right, has since been closed as an outbreak control measure there. So this slide shows the epidemic curve for the first 425 cases in the Wuhan SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. It's essentially, uh, an epidemic curve is essentially a histogram of the number of cases on the y-axis by the date of symptom onset on the x-axis. Importantly, this date on the x-axis is not the date of infection. Infection would have occurred earlier by about an incubation period, right? About five days uh, worth a range of two to 14 days for each case. The graph uh, goes back to late November and shows the first few cases as having occurred, having onset as early as December 8th and 10th. The darker shaded orange bars show that those cases that were epidemiologically linked to the Huanan wet market. So you can quickly see how in the early phase of the outbreak, most of the cases were linked to that market, but later on, most of the cases were not linked to the market, but rather acquired through community transmission. You can also see the rapid exponential growth in cases as time went on, reflecting the more widespread transmission. In fact, the epidemic doubled in size about every 7.4 days as estimated in this study. 
since this investigation only focused it on the first 425 cases of what would later be more than 90,000 cases in all of China, the peak of this curve and the top of the and, and the drop off that followed uh, don't reflect the actual epidemic trend in the Wuhan outbreak. This is really just the experience of the first 425 cases. So there are some interesting developments noted on the timeline. On December 29th, it became clear that some of the pneumonia cases were linked to the Huanan seafood wholesale market. On December 30th, when it was clear that there was a growing outbreak of pneumonia for which a causal agent couldn't be identified, a systematic search and for and a detailed epidemiologic investigation of all the similar cases that were out there going both forward and backward in time was begun. On December 31st, the Wuhan Health Commission announced the outbreak and involved the uh, national China CDC in the investigation and the response. And January 1st, the Huanan seafood wholesale market was closed. On January 8th, it was announced that the pathogen causing the outbreak uh, of pneumonia was a novel coronavirus. By January 10th, the Chinese publicly shared the genetic sequence of this novel coronavirus, and this enabled other scientists to begin uh, working on, on the situation. And on January 13th, the first confirmed case of coronavirus, novel coronavirus, uh, was reported outside of China in a woman who became ill and, and infected and ill in Wuhan, but traveled to Thailand. She was identified through a routine temperature screening check on arrival at the international airport in Bangkok and immediately hospitalized, hopefully uh, preventing too much further spread there. And the uh, Thailand health officials immediately began contact tracing and isolation and, and quarantine procedures. On January 19th, the first reports of a confirmed case outside of Wuhan province, but within China, was reported in someone who had traveled from Wuhan. So this first report of just uh, 425 first cases, you can begin to see the potential for something much larger than what was happening in Wuhan, China. So the investigators go on to describe the characteristics of these 425 novel coronavirus infected pneumonia cases. Overall, the median age was 59 years, about 56% were male. Prior to January 1st, you can see 55% of the cases were linked to the Huanan wholesale seafood market compared with only 8.6% of cases thereafter. And um, they also found that an increasing proportion of cases over time had either uh, live animal market exposure, uh, sorry, had, had neither live animal uh, market exposure nor exposure to a person with respiratory symptoms, um, suggesting a potential for asymptomatic spread. And uh, finally, we begin to see evidence of early and increasing spread among healthcare workers who presumably were taking care of, of patients coming to hospital. Because of the detailed interviewer interviews that the investigators conducted with cases and the review of medical records that, that was part of the outbreak investigation, it was possible to confirm the time from exposure, for example, say to the wet market or to an individual that had symptoms, it's possible to confirm the time of exposure to the date of symptom onset, or what we know as the incubation period for many of these first cases. So looking at the distribution of these incubation periods across all of the patients, the investigators were able to determine that the mean incubation period was about 5.2 days, and 95% of those incubation periods were less than 12.5 days. Through the contact tracing process, it was possible to estimate the serial interval between the cases, um, which they found to be about 7.5 days on average. And through modeling and putting some of this information into uh, mathematical models that were linked to the outbreak data, it's possible to estimate the basic reproductive number, which they found to be 2.2, meaning that each new case would give, uh, give rise to, on average, another 2.2 cases, which sets the stage for epidemic growth. And uh, these investigators concluded from this outbreak investigation, this early outbreak investigation, that there's evidence that human-to-human -human transmission has occurred among those contacts, among close contacts, since the middle of December 2019. 
considerable efforts to reduce transmission will be required to control outbreaks if similar dynamics apply elsewhere. Measures to prevent or reduce transmission should be implemented in populations at risk. In fact, what happened subsequently in Wuhan and other parts of China, they, they would go on to implement strict lockdown and other control measures, which, which limited the impact to about 90,000 cases and about 4,700 deaths reported. And you can see down on the lower right here that after that initial burst of, of cases in January and February, China reported very few cases of uh, coronavirus since then. However, uh, the novel coronavirus went on to cause a pandemic of over 28 million cases and over 900,000 deaths in 188 countries around the world to date and growing. The numbers are continuing to rise and causing more than 5,000 deaths per day in recent months. And the U.S. leads the world in terms of the number of reported cases at over 6 million, followed by India and Brazil. I will say that it's tricky to interpret the absolute number of cases and the related trends. I'm also showing here globally, these are the number of cases that are um, reported uh, each day. It's tricky because these are driven both by the spread of the infection and the occurrence of illness, as well as the extent to which testing is being scaled up, which results in more counting of mild and asymptomatic cases. So I, I tend to also really want to look at data on hospitalizations um, or deaths, which are a little bit more objective or not, not subject to some of the um, influences of the trends in testing. Of course, and unfortunately, global data on COVID hospitalizations are not universally available, but there are global data on, on deaths that are more reliable. And on this slide, you can see that the U.S. also leads the world in the total absolute numbers of deaths so far, uh, followed by Brazil and India and Mexico, all on, very, on, on fairly steep um, upward trajectories, not leveling off like some of the other countries. And China, you can see, is really quite far down here. You can also look at, that was the total absolute number of deaths, and you can also look at the death data per million population, deaths per million population, um, which gives a different rank order of countries. You can see here that Peru, Belgium, Spain, Brazil, then followed by the UK, Italy, the US, uh, Mexico, and France are at the top of the list here. But still, those uh, there, you, you see some concerning upward trajectories in the deaths per million population in Peru. And as we saw before, Brazil, the US, and Mexico. And here you can appreciate the uh, upward rising trend in South Africa, which hopefully is headed towards a leveling off phase soon. So transitioning into the U.S., we have set up systematic surveillance for COVID-19 disease, um, and this information is reported by state health departments and city health departments and CDC. What we're learning from surveillance in terms of the, what, what are we learning from surveillance in terms of the demographic and clinical characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 cases in the U.S.? I'm going to just show you a few tables from a, a recent MMWR that reported on over 1.3 million cases that, that, that had been reported to the CDC through May 30th, 2020. So from this MMWR, this table shows the sex and age distribution of the 1.3 million cases reported through uh, May 30th, going across the table, sex and age, and, and the underlying health conditions and symptoms going across the uh, side of the table here. About 21.8% of the cases had that were reported to CDC actually had available information on underlying health conditions. It doesn't mean the other, you know, 80% didn't have symptoms, but they they it wasn't reported. So so they did an analysis that looks at just those 287,000 cases for whom symptom information was reported. And uh, sorry, in this case, underlying health conditions. And among those that had available information on underlying health conditions, the common underlying health conditions included cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, renal disease, and diabetes. And similarly, for symptoms for the 28.3% for whom information on symptoms was reported, nearly 70% had fever cough or shortness of breath, and only 30, only 43% had fever, interestingly. 50% had cough, 28% had shortness of breath, 
36% had myalgia or muscle aches, and about 20% had sore throat, 34% had headache, 20% had diarrhea, and 8.3% had loss of smell or taste, also known to be a hallmark symptom of COVID-19. So this slide shows the demographic characteristics and frequencies of hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and deaths going across the, the table here among the COVID-19 patients. Looking, look, call your attention to the bottom of the table here, which shows sort of some of the, the total numbers, these sort of bottom line numbers here. About 14% of the report of the 1.3 million cases that were reported resulted in hospitalization. This percentage was ended up being higher among males and also among persons age 60 and over. And looking at the portion hospitalized, it was much higher, about 45% among those that had underlying health conditions. And this was true for every age group. About 2.3% of case patients were admitted to the ICU. And, and this percentage was higher for persons aged 50 and older, and among persons with underlying health conditions in um, pretty much every age group. And about 5.4% of all reported cases resulted in death, which was strongly related to age and presence of an underlying health condition. So these surveillance data, while, while they don't contain a lot of details, such as race, ethnicity, or you know, actual risk factors that, that led to the infection, they do give you a sense of the spectrum of disease and the outcomes um, among those who have symptoms. In terms of transmission, another one of your readings investigated a cluster of SARS-CoV-2 cases that were exposed at a choir practice in Skagit County, Washington State in March 2020, which was a time before indoor mass gatherings were prohibited and a time before masks were universally required. And this investigation of about 120 people in a church choir found that uh, among the 61 members who attended the March 10th practice at this practice, this choir practice included an individual who had developed SARS-CoV-2 symptoms between the prior choir practice and the subsequent one. This person was at the March 10th choir practice and as well as the 60 other members that, that attended, at least 87% of those folks went on to exhibit COVID-like symptoms, and most of these cases were laboratory confirmed. So like if you can imagine a choir practice where there might be some social interactions, but for the most part, people are you know, singing and facing the same direction, maybe often loudly for extended periods, that one case could have resulted in such a high attack rate suggests there's some aerosolization of viral particles that even for one individual, can greatly contribute to spread. In addition, and th this would be, you know, in addition to the droplet and fomite spread that was really thought of as the predominant mode of transmission for SARS-CoV-2 prior to prior, prior to investigations like this. Moreover, that that such a large percentage of people exhibited symptoms suggests a more substantial infectious dose that resulted from this exposure. This, so this is an example of a so-called super spreader event where because of the timing with the infectious period of that one person combined with an activity that is highly conducive to spread, the, the singing without masks and indoors, perhaps not so well ventilated place, combined with a large number of people who were exposed can generate large numbers of cases well above the two or three new infections on average per case that have been estimated. So moving on to the West African Ebola virus outbreak in 2014, this is a really nice art artist illustration, rendition of the Congo River in the DRC, which is near where the Ebola virus was first discovered in 1976. And you'll notice that the, uh, the shape of the river in this rendition closely matches the shape of the Ebola virus. So this is an electron micrograph and a schematic of the Ebola virus. It comes from the Phyloviridae family or phylovirus. It's about 80 nanometers in diameter and 970 nanometers in length. 
first recognized in 1976, and it's caused sporadic outbreaks ever since. In terms of symptoms, it causes very severe acute illness with some of the symptoms listed here and unique ones, including vomiting, diarrhea, and macular papular rash. Hemorrhaging can also occur, which comes along with some organ involvement, liver damage, renal damage, and central nervous system involvement. The case fatality rates can be very high, upwards of 50 to 90 percent, and the incubation period can range from 2 to 21 days, with a mean that ranges from 4 to 10 days. The reservoir of Ebola virus is not, still not definitively known, despite extensive attempts to try to, uh, to, to figure it out and, and several investigations, epidemiological and virological, uh, ecological investigations. Uh, the best guess is that it's possibly fruit bats. In terms of the infectious period, it's it doesn't uh, it, it's not thought to be infectious before the development of fever, and it becomes progressively infectious as symptoms worsen. And the treatment is supportive, with experimental treatments being evaluated in humans. In terms of modes of transmission, Ebola is transmitted both directly and indirectly, person to person via exposure to infected bodily fluids, and also indirectly through contacts with surfaces or objects that were recently contaminated with the virus, uh, such as clothes or bed sheets. They can remain infectious for quite some time. Risk factors include caregivers or other close, close contacts of persons with Ebola virus disease. Uh, so family members and loved ones and others are at risk. Healthcare workers are also uh, very much at risk. You can also acquire Ebola through direct contact with corpses of people who have died, who, who have died from Ebola virus disease. For example, if you're preparing the corpses for burial and other direct or indirect contact with bodily fluids. Um, this is a nice schematic, a nice graphic from the New York Times that sort of showed the, the history of Ebola outbreaks leading up to the large outbreak in West Africa in 2014. So going all the way back to 1976 with the, uh, the outbreak of uh, Ebola in Sudan and DRC, Congo, the, the dark orange represents the number of deaths and the light orange represents the total number of cases. So you can get a sense of the uh, case fatality rate. But we didn't hear much from Ebola for quite some time between 1976 until 1995. And then um, after 2000, um, it would show up more and more frequently until uh, you know, the largest outbreak to date began in, in 2014 in Guinea, Liberia, and, and Sierra Leone. So these three countries um, in West Africa are, you know, not huge in terms of population, ranging from about 4.1 million to about 11.5 uh, million. And the, they do have some, some urban centers and a very low GDP per capita, very low, very limited healthcare capacity and infrastructure with, you know, very few physicians per 100,000 population, especially in Liberia and Sierra Leone and also not much in the way of hospital beds. You can get a sense of the healthcare infrastructure or lack thereof through, through the estimates of maternal mortality per 100,000 live births. In terms of the Human Development Index, these, these three countries rank among some of the lowest in the world. So these are very resource poor settings and not, with not much resources and infrastructure to respond to an outbreak of Ebola virus, a large outbreak of Ebola virus. From your reading, one thing, so, so you know, one, one way to get in front of an outbreak quickly is to detect it early. You, you can see from this, this graph and from that part of your reading that the outbreaks in, in each setting were likely going on for some months before they were actually detected. And that sets up the opportunity for a longer period of time that, that spread can go unchecked before uh, some interventions can happen to, to limit it. This is showing the case series, the initial case series from the 2014 outbreak in Guinea, just showing the uh, patients and their ages and which hospital they went to, what symptoms they had, their, their outcome, and, and then summarizing some of this information. They, were, they, can, they showed that they were able to isolate the virus in five of the 15 patients um, and th that when they sequenced the genome of that, that particular Ebola virus in that outbreak, it was closest genetically to 
an outbreak in DRC and Gabon that and, and Gabon, and so uh, that, that may give some hints as to where the uh, the reservoir for this particular outbreak exists. About 12 of the 14 people with known vital status have died, so an 86% uh, case fatality rate. An, an epidemiological investigation, which looked for more cases, found 111 possible cases with 79 deaths, so also a very high case fatality rate early on, 71%. Quickly, it became clear that, and, and in this and, and other outbreaks, you know, the vulnerability of healthcare workers to infection. And th this slide is showing the the, the number of, of deaths and cases in healthcare workers, and and uh, you know, deaths of healthcare workers due due to uh, these outbreaks is horrible in, in any setting, but particularly in these resource poor settings where there are, are so few healthcare workers per capita, it can be essentially a, um, you know, a, a very debilitating outcome in terms of, you know, responding to and managing the outbreak. So what are some of the outbreak response or control measures? Uh, you know, promoting biosafety and infection control in healthcare facilities and for first responders and at burials is, is critical, and this requires a lot of training and supplies. Of course, trying to minimize the risk of, of spillover from animal populations to humans is very important. So reducing contact with, with bats, improving disease surveillance so that you can detect outbreaks earlier before they can begin to uh, get foothold in populations. And then rapid case investigation with contact tracing, isolation and quarantine and providing the supplies and support needed to effectively execute those activities. And, and better laboratory diagnostics can also be really valuable to help with earlier detection of, of outbreaks. And finally, clinician education to recognize potential cases um, so that they also don't go undiagnosed. In terms of this particular outbreak, at, it was it was hoped that you could get to a point where all of, all of them were doing, you know, very exhaustive contact tracing. And at one point after this was scaled up, all three countries were reporting that more than 80% of the registered contacts of the known cases were being traced. They did report a fairly low mean number of contacts, wouldn't be as high as you might expect, but this was still, you know, a step in the right direction. The goals for the UN mission for the Ebola emergency response aims to isolate about 75% 70 of the cases and safely bury 70% of the deaths. And so you can get a sense of you know, what was going on um, here in, in Guinea and also in Liberia and Sierra Leone, where their progress was uh, slightly slower on isolation and, and uh, safe burials. But at, at this time, every EVD-affected district in the three intense transmission countries did have access to a laboratory for case confirmation where they, they could get confirmation of affection status within 24 hours. Okay, so this slide shows the geographic distribution of Ebola treatment centers in the region, and as well as laboratories and contact tracing programs, where places where safe burial procedures have been set up, and the uh, letters and blocks indicate each of the components of the response to the outbreak. And the color coding refers to, you know, in red, where these activities are really not functional, even though they may be claiming that they exist, they're, they're not up and running. Whereas in green, it's indicated that these activities are functional. So just to give you a sense of how challenging it can be to get systems like this up and running quickly in the middle of a, in the middle of a public health crisis in areas where there is very uh, little health and uh, medical and public health infrastructure. To give you a sense of what some of the response looked like, some pictures from, from the news. Um, this is showing workers in Liberia, Liberia on their way to, to bury uh, a woman who died recently of the Ebola virus, so a, a safe burial team. This slide is showing healthcare worker or health workers that are doing health education in the community to tell people about Ebola virus and to advise them about some of these safe practices, uh, what, what to do and what not to do and things like that.
In addition to those three countries in West Africa, the epidemic did spread to other nearby countries. So um, in Senegal, which has a population of about 13 million, there was one imported case for uh, fr from an affected area and they identified contacts and, and observed them for 21 days and didn't see any additional cases. In Nigeria, which is a very large country in, in the region, a population of 174 million, there was one imported case from an infected area with 20 subsequent cases and eight deaths, but no additional cases after that. And in Mali, a population of 14.5 million, there were two imported cases resulting in eight cases in the country and six deaths. To give you an idea of the cases in uh, of, of the contact tracing that happened rapidly in Nigeria, this this slide is showing the you know the, the occurrence of the case that was imported, followed by the subsequent cases that re resulted, and the contact tracing activities that 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 ensued identified additional waves of spread. Actually, there were three generations of spread from the index case to, to many, many initial cases in the first wave, a few cases in the second wave, and a few cases in the third wave. This was slowed down because of the contact tracing process. The, the contact tracers in Nigeria identified contacts, 891 contacts, and uh, observed them for the full 21 days and that included 18,500 face-to-face visits. So a really, really hard work. And you know, just to give you a sense, and we're seeing this also with the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak pandemic, that the labor-intensive work that goes along with contact tracing. But when 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 the cases are small and not too, when, when the spread is not too um, wide in the community, it's really possible to to stop these outbreaks. As you can get a sense, it could have gone much differently in Nigeria had the uh, case not been detected. There was also spread outside of the West African region. Some of this was export of cases that were acquired in West Africa that traveled to other countries. But you can get a sense here, the, the, uh, the different countries where cases spread to. We had two cases of infection that were, we had several cases that, of infection that were imported to the US from West Africa and a few cases that were actually acquired in, US, so in the US, so spread of Ebola in, in the US. But it really did not spread um, you know, rapidly or in an uncontrolled way, the way it, it did in the, subset, in the West African region. Here's an example of some of the, the temperature screening that can exist at airports to, again, help to reduce the amount of imported cases or travel associated cases. At the end of the day, there were about 28,000 cases in the three mainly largely affected countries in West Africa in the 2016 outbreak. About 15,000 of them were laboratory confirmed and 11,000 of, of those cases resulted in death. And you can see here the small number of cases of Ebola virus in some of the other countries. Since 2016, there have been much smaller outbreaks, but nothing that has gotten to the level of spread that we saw in, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia as part of that, that 2014 outbreak. So wh why did we not observe the pandemic spread that we saw with SARS-CoV-2 with Ebola? Clearly, there was widespread transmission of Ebola happening in the three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, and there was even travel-associated cases. But it didn't, even outside of the uh, West African region to other parts of the world, but it didn't result in the widespread transmission that we've seen with SARS-CoV-2. One important reason is that it relates to the infectious period. The infectious period of Ebola really does not begin until the presence of fever. And compared to SARS-CoV-2, the situation is different. The infection period can, the infectious period can be um, completely asymptomatic, or there can be a, an infectious period where the, the virus can be passed on prior to the development of symptoms or during the pre-symptomatic period. 
So that makes it easier for detection of cases and and limiting spread, right? If you have a, a, a system that screens people for fever, you can potentially identify cases of Ebola and isolate them and preventing onward spread more easily than you could with, say, SARS-CoV-2. The other big reason relates to the mode of transmission. You do require exposure to bodily fluids for with Ebola for people to to become infected. Often people have to be have to be quite sick before those exposures can occur. And so the potential for pandemic spread of Ebola the way that we see with some other viruses that have been, you know, very successful at causing pandemics is really quite a bit lower, uh, thankfully. What you really see in the case of Ebola is that when, where you have very limited healthcare infrastructure and public health infrastructure, where you may not detect an outbreak that is going on until it, it's, it's well underway, you can run into some very serious problems with uh, wide scale community transmission. Okay, so moving on to Zika, the Zika virus outbreak in 2015-16. This is a quote from WHO Director General at the time, Margaret Chan, of the rapidly evolving outbreak of Zika warns us that an old disease that slumbered for six decades in Africa and Asia can suddenly wake up on a new continent to cause a global health emergency. So Zika virus was first identified in a monkey in Uganda in 1947. It's an RNA virus in the flaviviruses genus, and other flaviviruses in, in that genus include dengue, West Nile fever, yellow fever, and St. Louis encephalitis. There have been two lineages of, of Zika virus identified, an African lineage and an Asian lineage. And the Zika that is circulating in the Americas beginning in, in 2015 and 16 is related to the Asian lineage. In terms of clinical characteristics, the incubation period is 2 to 12 days. Um, most of the infections are asymptomatic, and when they are symptomatic, it's usually a mild self-limited illness of short duration. Common sim- symptoms include maculopapular rash, fever, non-purulent con- conjunctivitis, and joint aches, arthralgias. It affects all age groups. And comparing to some of the other common flaviviruses, dengue and chikungunya, you can see in terms of some of the the symptoms profile, the things that that distinguish Zika from some of the others, specifically the presence of conjunctivitis and also the absence of things like hemorrhage and shock. So there are some adverse outcomes of Zika virus infection, even though most cases are mild. Zika virus infection during pregnancy can cause a condition um, called microcephaly and or small head, and also it is associated with some severe birth defects and fetal death. It can also cause Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is associated with the Zika virus infection. Um, there have been some cases reported in, in a couple of different outbreaks. Death has been reported among people with Zika virus infection, but is generally pretty rare. If infection is uh, occurs during pregnancy, it can be passed on to the fetus in utero or to the newborn at delivery. Infection occurring at any point during pregnancy may cause some birth defects, and previous Zika virus infection is unlikely to affect future pref- uh, pregnancies. And if you did have it in the past, it likely would confer immunity against future infection. In terms of the perinatal effects, um, these can be pretty devastating. Um, intrauterine fetal demise, intrauterine gro- growth restriction, small head for, for age, microcephaly, and uh, you know, other you know, very serious, serious bad uh, conditions for the fetus and infant. Microcephaly is the clinical finding of a small head when compared to infants of the same age. You measure it by uh, looking at the head circumference. So you you can see here a baby with a typical head size and a baby born with microcephaly has a much smaller head circumference than a baby born with uh, severe microcephaly. And so this is one of the main concerning outcomes of viral infection with Zika during pregnancy. 
In terms of how it's transmitted, it is primarily mosquito-borne, and there have been additional routes of, of other uh, other routes of infection identified. I mean, we mentioned maternal-fetal, which is a direct mode of transmission. Also, sexual transmission is d- direct, and uh, blood transfusion and also laboratory exposures um, have been shown to cause uh, Zika virus infection. There haven't been any reports of transmission of Zika via breast milk or saliva. So as a mosquito-borne illness, it's not the case that every mosquito can transmit every mosquito-borne infection. In the case of Zika, the the particular species that is is efficient at transmitting Zika virus are the Aedes mosquitoes. And these are day-biting mosquitoes that lay eggs in domestic water holding containers. Um, They can live in and around households. And specifically among the Aedes species, there's Aedes aegypti, which is the most efficient vector. And it's not present in the Northeast U.S. You've, it, it's been uh, known to exist in some of the southern uh, states and also in the southwest. But Aedes, albopic, Aedes albopictus is um, a potential vector, um, not the most efficient one, but is present in the Northeast U.S. You can see some pictures of these different mosquitoes here. In terms of the life cycles, mostly it's a it's a life cycle that occurs between monkeys and mosquitoes in the sylvatic or jungle cycle. Occasionally, one of these mosquitoes could bite and infect a human, which in turn could be bitten by a mosquito that could continue to, in, in, a, in a more urban, what's called an epidemic or urban cycle, which can result in continued transmission between mosquitoes and humans outside of the sylvatic cycle. In terms of prior Zika outbreaks, uh, before 2007, these, these were mainly sporadic cases in East Africa and Southeast Asia. The first human African case was in 1954, and the first human cases in Asia were in 1968 and 69. And the, the uh, other outbreaks that have happened since 2007 were in Micronesia and in French Polynesia. And it wasn't until 2015 where the virus was first detected in Brazil. And in 2016, began circulating in multiple countries throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Since 2011, though, laboratory-confirmed Zika virus cases, as you might expect, have been identified in travelers returning from areas that have this sort of sporadic local transmission. And in the 2016 outbreak, travel-related cases were increasing because of travel to those areas of the world where there, there was an outbreak. There have been lab-confirmed cases of sexual transmission that have been documented, and imported cases of the virus have resulted in local spread, even in the continental U.S. Specifically, there have been confirmed cases of local Zika virus transmission in Florida and also, I believe, Texas. So in 2016, this is a map showing the areas that had active Zika transmission happening. By the end of 2016, there were over 5,000 symptomatic Zika virus cases reported, um, and that included about 4,900 cases in travelers that were infected elsewhere and returning to the U.S. About 224 cases were acquired through presumed local mosquito transmission in Florida and in Texas. And 47 cases were identified to have acquired, be acquired through other routes, including sexual transmission and a single case of laboratory transmission and person-to-person transmission through an as yet unknown route. And transmission was much more significant in U.S. territories. In New York City, uh, there were about 559 lab-confirmed cases as of September of 2016, and this is, these slides are a little out of date, and if you check for all of New York State, there were about 1,000 cases reported for all of 2016. 59 of them were pregnant at the time of diagnosis, and there were no instances of locally acquired Zika virus transmitted within New York during 2016. There was one New York City baby um, with Zika-related microcephaly that was born in, in July of 2016, where they tested positive for the Zika virus, and the mother had been in an area of active Zika transmission during pregnancy.
So there was there, there there were instances of local transmission in the U.S. in Florida and Texas. This slide is showing the a geographic area where some of the first cases of local transmission of Zika in Florida were were occurring. At that time, CDC had recommended that uh, as a result that pregnant women and and their partners, because of the sexual transmission aspect, consider postponing any non-essential travel to to that area. In terms of prevention, there's no vaccine currently available. So the, the best thing to do is to avoid mosquito bites as much as possible. Uh, and women who are pregnant or may become pregnant should postpone travel to any areas that are affected by Zika. And when, if, if and when you do need to travel, you should take extra precautions to reduce or prevent mosquito bites. And to reduce sexual transmission of Zika, there, there, has, there should be um, preventive measures in place to prevent transmission to women who are pregnant or could become pregnant. In terms of reducing the risk of maternal to fetal transmission, women who may become pregnant and travel to Zika affected areas should are advised to use effective contraceptive methods to prevent an unplanned pregnancy while they could potentially be exposed and uh, to prevent nosocomial transmission, um, the standard protections are, are applicable with, you know, given the uh, laboratory exposure of, of one patient that was confirmed to have acquired Zika through a laboratory exposure, um, again, a, you know, usual precautions apply as that case was linked to an accident in the laboratory.